All right, welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm very happy to have with me a very special guest for this episode. It's Mike Cannell from the Cannells. Thank you for being with me. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited. Really appreciate that you're, uh, you've are you had me on. So, Yeah, I'm, I've been a, a big fan of the Cannells since the since ring came out really i i was a big fan um the alternative radio was playing get a gun and stone cold yesterday and then when slack jaw and, and 7475 came out i had to run out and get that album right away because it, it was those songs were really great and we'll talk about really great in a bit but uh <laughs> the other thing about it was that i found such incredible gems on that album uh, especially new boy and disappointed those ended up being those are probably my two favorite canal songs oh wow wow yep. so there i don't know go. if you want to give away any trade secrets uh i know lyricists often don't but um do you want to tell me a little bit about uh new boy and disappointed to get us started here <laughs> uh yeah i could do that first i'm going to get my dog up on the, uh, the sofa okay he's gonna be that's, barking that's fine. The i apologize all right charlie come here <laughs> we got a little bonus guest this time out here on Michael's record collection. Yeah, and we we hope that he'll uh, keep his big mouth shut on the whole. <laughs> so yeah, you know it has been it's been a long time, um, obviously since I wrote those tunes. Um, I mean, it would have been ninety one, ninety two. Uh, I don't think I think by by the end of ninety two we had all the songs that we were gonna record for Ring because we. It was in March of 93 that we went up to Woodstock with Lou Giordano to make that record. So um, it's, been, it's been a while. But uh, disappointed, um, you know, the, uh, it is another run-of-the-mill uh, failed relationship song, <laughs> which who knows what percentage of... Uh, rock pop songs or, or failed relationship songs but uh that's it's what it's yet another one mm -hmm. um for better or for worse um it, it is a little um a little more um acerbic i guess uh that that the lyric if i uh disappointed you i'm so sorry you're you're a disappointment too is not is not at all nice and i, I typically don't go down that path mm -hmm. but uh Damned if I didn't uh, with that song. I, I, I hope, I think that it was somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, yeah, it was. It's a failed relationship song. Um, <laughs> new boy, uh, on the other hand, is a, a new relationship <laughs> song. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and you know, I should. I I don't want to get. I, I don't. I didn't have definite ideas necessarily. Uh, sitting down to write it, um, um, but it, you know, I guess it's just uh, trying to capture that uh, feeling. You know, when you're enamored of someone for the first time, and um, so, some of the uh, emotions that that. Uh, spawns it's now you know it's been a long time since i've experienced that as well but um yeah they're, they're just throwaway pop songs you know um i do like you know the melodies for both those tunes mm -hmm. um and what the other guys did with their arrangements um george huntley that single note part in um in new boy uh, uh I, it's i guess you'd call it the signature um single note part mm -hmm. uh, works really well i think um and you know we employed uh, a tactic that we used probably way too much but the whole breakdown you know we're um it's typically in the last verse um it, with hopefully you know creating some dynamic when you build back into that final round of uh, choruses and uh doug did some ad libbing um uh at the at the end uh on the you know the the uh rollout or whatever i don't even know what you call that part of the song um but yeah uh live the song works to pretty good effect some nights and uh less so other nights 
But yeah. uh, it is one that routinely ends up in, in a set list. Uh, disappointed uh, is more hit or miss. Okay. But, uh, no, I appreciate. Yeah, I, I, um, I like those uh, tunes. Um, they don't, uh, you know, they're not uh, requested, you know, the way that, um, the, like, Slack Jawed, like you pointed out, mm -hmm. 74, 75 would be. Yeah, so. always been a deep track guy anyway, but uh, that album got me through some tough times. The 90s were not a, a good time for me, the early to mid 90s. So I, I thank you for the music. And um, well, I'm, you, yeah, I'm sorry. No, sorry it's great. I mean, I, I never, you know, I never went down a really dark path, but it, it was a tough time. And, and, and Ring was one of the albums that got me through that tough time. I've always turned to music to get me through the hard times and to help celebrate the good times. So speaking of good times, you guys have a new album coming out September 24th, it's your ninth album, Stedman's Wake. And this has been sort of a long time in the making. It's been 20 years since your last album, but uh, you put this together over a period of, a, of many years and including three songs that were on the old school dropouts album. Um, can you just talk, talk a little bit about Gladiator Heart, Rusted Fields, and, and Hello Walter and, and why you chose those to, to redo for this new album? Uh, it's a great question and one that I've pondered myself um, a few times. Um, I, I don't recall the thought pro process that went into that. Um, I mean, I think the, the thinking was that any and all of the songs on that record, it had never been available for uh, digital distribution. or So we thought we could, um, you know, pilfer from that record, get away with it. Um, and you know, any of the songs would have benefited from the treatment that uh, those three were given um, when we got back in the studio. I, um, I, I swear I have been scratching my head a little bit, uh, asking myself, why, why the hell did I, you know, lobby angle for those three versus, you know, songs like Back in Blighty Put Down um, and, and some others on, on that record. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, uh, which would have been a little more raucous and up-tempo. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I do, um, I like Rusted Fields a lot, notwithstanding the fact that it is, you know, a snoozer, uh, mid-tempo. But I think that it, um, at some point in the tune, it generates a little bit of ex um more excitement than, than the remainder of the tune. Mm -hmm. But um, the, just the um, sort of the images that I have in my mind with that tune, uh, I found um, sort of intriguing. And the whole notion of um, Southern-ness is, uh, you know, is sort of um, touched on in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty, um, I don't even, know the word um um yeah i'll leave it at that that uh i was trying trying to get somewhere with uh whatever it means to be southern especially in these times um mm -hmm. it is um i think i've tried to describe rust fields as sort of a post-apocalyptic love song um all that stuff about uh you know mills that are, are in there are a lot of textile mills here in the South that um, have just shuttered and, um, and and we live relatively close to a nuclear power plant. So the whole radioactive fills bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, and then, you know, cars rusting, uh, old cars rusting in fields is something that uh, it's not uncommon to see you know, driving through rural, the rural part of the South. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I really do like, uh, that tune. Um, Gladiator Heart, it, a little tougher to say why, um, uh, made that call. And, uh, and Hello, Hello Walter is, is more personal. It's about my best friend growing up. Um, and there are references to Macon, Georgia in the tune. Um, and we did, um, the river, that's mentioned is the Oak Mulgee River in Macon, Georgia, uh, and Rose Hill Cemetery 
uh, looks down on the Oak Mulgee, and that's where uh, Dwayne Allman and Barry Oakley are buried beside one another. Mm -hmm. They died about a year apart, uh, both on motorcycles there in Macon. And so that was, a, uh, understandably, a big hangout. Um, so, you know, the squares and the freaks were uh, converging <laughs> on uh, Rose Hill Cemetery. Yeah. Um, so, the, yeah, that song, you know, has personal significance for me, which might ha have some reason, um, have something to do with why I selected that one. Yeah, you, you brought up the, the lyric there. I, I wrote it down, out beyond the mills and the radioactive fills, we went out into the night. And such an evocative line. And I I was, I wrote down, is this a real place? Where is this? So, uh, you know, you kind of talked about that a little bit. Yeah, there's uh, adjacent to the county that, that I live in, Wake County is uh, Chatham County. And it is um, it is largely rural. Um you know, even though that's changing a little bit like everything else. But uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful countryside. Um, but with, you know, some of those uh, uh, fields with uh, littered with, with the carcasses of old cars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the juxtaposition is uh, intriguing. But, yeah, I mean, I just I, I love um, just driving in, through the countryside in Chatham County. So it was, uh, in, which is also where the nuclear power plant happens to be. So all of that uh, brought that uh, particular, you know, part of this state to mind. Mm -hmm. There's a band right now, as it stands, is, is yourself on guitar and vocals, David Connell, your brother on bass, Doug McMillan on vocals, uh, Steve Potak on keyboards, you know, Mike Ayers on guitar, who's been in the band since 2002. He take he took over for George Huntley or, or is in the position that George Huntley formerly was in. And Rob Ladd on drums has been in the band since 2012. This is Mike Ayers and Rob Ladd's first appearance on a Canals album? It is, yeah. Um, like you pointed out, Ayers, Mike Ayers started playing with us um, probably not, long what, what year did you say uh, i think two, it said 2002 i believe i got that from the website yeah so that would have been right after um and i say released um old school dropouts we i mean there wasn't really any release to speak of it, yeah. those were demos we thought that we were going to still be with T get back in the studio with tvt records mm -hmm. and so th those were songs we just recorded in our practice space um and uh, so when we got dropped by TVT, you know, we were like, well, we've, we've you know, demoed these tunes, uh, what to do with them, uh, think uh, with no thought at all to, to try and uh, to try to get back into the studio to make, you know, quote unquote, a proper record. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just uh, pre pressed up some CDs and put them out, you know, as is and, you uh, Again, that that was uh, th that record was not available digitally, mm -hmm. and yeah. so that's why we thought we could, we could get away with uh, with a re uh, recycling yeah. uh, three of those tunes. Um, so yeah, Airs uh, has, has has been with us all through those uh, you know the the twenty years that this record was really slowly coming together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's no longer, you know, we all, well, we have day jobs now and, and, and you know, families came along. So uh, it's not like we, uh, when we would, when the record company would send us, you know, to Woodstock, New York or Wales uh, for four or five weeks um, to, to make a record. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, the impulse and the opportunity to write songs uh it's 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 tougher with um you know dogs and and children uh running around yeah uh, just not as much time um but uh, yeah so I, I i it's a real wound roundabout way of um um I don't know how I got on that tangent uh, with Mike Ayers, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ayers has been with us for a long time. Rob Ladd was a session guy out in California. He's played with a lot of bands 
Um, he played on half of that Alanis Morissette record that um, a, a bitter pill, a jagged, little, jagged pill. little pill. Yeah, yeah. That was so huge. And for three years, he was Don Henley's drummer when Henley went on tour. So uh, that, you know, in and of itself says something about his his drum playing ability. I mean, this is a playing drums for the guy who was the drummer for the Eagles. Uh, mm -hmm. I think probably says about, you know, all that you would need to say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is, um, you, you mentioned old school dropouts. Uh, I'm waiting on my copy to come. Uh, Bandcamp sent me a, a notice that it's coming. I already got the, I downloaded the, the digital version and I've been listening to that. And the three songs that made it to, to Stedman's Wake, they're not significantly different, but they, they have a, a, obviously a better production. They, they sound a little more full, a little more, um, I guess uh, there's a little more meat on the bones. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's yeah, a, they're, 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 they're good songs. And, um, you know, it, it certainly would, uh, wouldn't be bad if all of them got that treatment uh, at some point. Oh, yeah. No, as, ba as bad as it is. And, you know, I know that... Um... It seems like in the 80s it was happening to some extent. You know, I know that there were Smith's records where some particular tune would show up on, on two or three different records. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, oh, yeah, I've uh, absolutely given thought to um, <laughs> doing the same with, again, some of the more upbeat uh, tunes. Yeah. Uh, and now we would just go to uh, our sound man for 30 odd years tim harper is um is now set up to record in his uh he has a little studio back of his house which also happens to be our practice space so yeah we do we now could just do that very thing um, mm -hmm. um again so few people have heard old school dropouts or aware of it um well that's probably true of all of our records but uh <laughs> especially true of that one that uh i think we we probably could get away with it and mm -hmm. i definitely uh, given some thought to that to that very thing yeah yeah um some of these songs were done with mitch easter who, who you haven't worked with in quite some time in fact you guys for a long time i, I don't think you guys have, had ever used the same producer uh what was it like to to work with mitch and what was the breakdown with the songs you did with mitch and the songs you did with john um Plamal? yeah john plymall plymall yeah. um yeah uh it was a uh great to get back with mitch i mean it, um it had it was the drive-in back in 87 when we recorded boylan heights mm -hmm. which was the, the second record um so his studio now is the delatorium and it is uh it's uh, uh you know it's, uh, it's it's state of the art it's awesome um so we went in to do the basic tracks for five of the tunes and i swear i think um I think Rusted Fields and Gladiator Heart were, were in the mix. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the other three uh, basic tracks that we did there would have been. But um, cause it, was, it was the summer of 2016 that we went in with Mitch, mm -hmm. you know, thinking uh, naively that uh, we would uh, be driven and, um, you know, that we could make it work logistically, you know, to knock it out sooner than five years, <laughs> which it ultimately took. Um, yeah, I had no inkling that it was going to take that length of time. You know, granted, uh, some things interfered. Rob Ladd was in a uh, really bad automobile accident. And, you know, it was uh, touch and go even there for a while. Um, mm. And COVID, of course. Yeah, the um, pandemic pushed it back. Um, how long did that push it? End up pushing it just like a year and a half. I think that's about right. So John Plymall went up to New York with uh, with Greg Calby for the mastering in March, early March of 2020. I mean, days before the world shut down. Uh, well, this part of the world, I, I realized, you know, uh, parts of of uh, Asia and Europe that were already there. But uh, yeah, so, you know, as you know, the world started um, shutting down in the U.S. there in mid-March of 2020. So the mastering had been done days before that. Uh, so, yeah, at that point, we thought, get it mastered, 
you know, shop it for a few months. And if nothing, if no one bites, release it ourselves in say August or September of 2020. So I guess closer to a year, I'd push it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's coming out, it's on Black Park slash Missing Peace Records. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find that it's a bit um, nerve wracking for you waiting for the release to come out? If this thing's been in the can for so long? That's a great question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm second, I, I second guess um, with good reason. I second guessed every record we made um, and, you know, felt ambivalent. Um, you know, there are always things that you wish that you'd done otherwise uh, or things that you had done that you just didn't do at all. Um, so, yeah, um, I do find myself um, a little anxious about, you know, how this might be received. Again, yeah, it's not, um, it, it won't, um, you know, I, I, you know, I say all that in, um, I've seen enough, um, like anyone who's lived, you know, 60 odd years, especially recently with between, um, you know, political turmoil in this country and a global pandemic, it, it puts things, you know, quickly into proper perspective that, you know, uh, you know, hopefully some people will like some things about the record. Um, and, and I will, I just kind of, leave it at that yeah the first single was that you put out was really great and and i'm not just saying it was really great because that's the title it was a really great song i mean you talk about your upbeat songs this is one of the you know the popular um you know more upbeat tracks on the album and it's 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 got that acerbic or, or, or at least sarcastic bent to it that you were talking about with disappointed uh, because the the lyrics would point to somebody who's not really doing great, but it, it still has a, a positivity about it. Yeah, that's a great characterization. Um, uh, you know, part of the positivity is the fact that there ain't any minor chords in that song. It's all major chords, which is a rarity uh, for when I sit down to write a song. I mean, it's almost invariably involving a, a lot of minor, uh, well, minor chords. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, it's all major chords, which, you know, would tend to make a song sound brighter anyway. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it is, it is that tongue in cheek a bit with, uh, yeah, the, the, what is described in the verses, like you s suggest is, uh, is, 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 uh, is not doing so great at all. You know, the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, Stedman's Wake, the, the title track, you put this out also, it's already out on Spotify and the, the streaming services. What made this the right song for the title to be the title track for this album? Uh, I guess at some point there was something of a consensus within the band. Uh, what uh, what the individual band members felt best kind of represented what the band has become, where we are now. Um, and uh, a few of the guys uh, at least claimed to especially like that tune. And, you know, that played into it. Um, the fact maybe that it's a little more topical uh, than some of the other songs, even though kind of the references are, are hopefully you know a little ob oblique um because you know we were never gonna be a band or songwriters that were good enough to pull off some heavy political or social message uh, and you know I, I love it goes without saying you know everyone from dylan to springsteen so i mean you name it but we just weren't good enough songwriters to to begin to attempt that Mm -hmm. um, so Stedman's probably uh, veers as close to trying to make some sort of social or political commentary as as we as we get. 
Yeah. And, and, and that might have uh, been part of the rationale for, for that song. Um, and, um, I, you know, the record is um, maybe a little on the darker side, and that song certainly fits the bill in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's you talked about the the idea of what it means to be a Southerner today. And I think there's a lot of that buried in this song. They and not all that deep at times. I, I'm guessing it's not a coincidence that the choice of of, of the lyric about Malvern Hill um, it's in the same state as the final verse about Charlottesville, just seventy two miles away. That's really yeah, uh, that's, yeah, no one's uh, mentioned that until now, but yeah, and, you know, the opioid crisis, which is the first verse hit Virginia, especially hard, so it is a, it is a very Virginia-centric <laughs> song, um, so yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a great point, it is, it's, it could well all be within the state, well, two of the verses certainly are in the state of Virginia, and in that first verse, could be as well yeah i like the way that the the music kind of falls away and, and gets stripped down for the last verse it was uh i mean it, it really gives it i think a power even though there's there's less going on i think it makes a, a, a stronger statement there in that last verse do you remember if that was your idea or if it came from somewhere else that was not my idea that came from john plymall um i mean you know, I, I think that I was thinking it would probably be a fine idea to drop down just for, for uh, dynamics sake. Mm -hmm. But no, I did not uh, uh, for one second contemplate something that stripped down. Um, and, you know, you can you don't know how you're going to feel about something like that until you actually hear it. And when I heard it, you know, in the studio, I was like, well, yeah, that's pretty damn cool. And uh by all means, forget whatever idea I had about the final verse. Let's <laughs> let's go with that. So, um, well, that's yeah. Producers uh, sometimes they earn their money a little bit. <laughs> no, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do also like the lyric, uh, "These fine people with baseball bats," and it's <laughs> not a it's not a very hidden. Um, uh, you know, it's not very hidden what you're you know what you're referring to there. Yeah, that's not. Uh, I, I I said I tried to be a little oblique like you say it's that's not especially oblique it's it's um yeah it's it's a little more um literal mm -hmm. yeah. did you did you feel like as someone from you know you've been in north carolina i don't know if you're born there but you're, you've been in the north carolina area forever um did you feel a particular anger at what's been going on politically to that that sort of driv drove these these types of lyrics uh, it, and some of them maybe not being as subtle as, as you would normally be? Well, I was born in Georgia mm -hmm. and, and, and like I mentioned earlier, I uh, lived in Macon, Georgia for a long time. So I'm, I'm here to tell you. Um, uh, and when we moved, uh, I was born in Georgia, uh, moved to North Carolina for a while and when moved back, when I moved back to Georgia with my with my family, I mean the perception of people in Macon, Georgia, with these kids from North Carolina are, are Yankees. Uh, I mean that's how you know. There's the South, and then there's the Deep South, right? And the Deep South being Mississippi, you know, um, Alabama, Georgia, um, North Carolina, and Virginia are more you know considered uh, the Upper South, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, anger. Yeah, a lot of anger. A lot of anger uh, for um, a, a good bit of the previous uh, five, four or five years, and uh, in, in what has been going on in this in this country. Yeah, yeah. Um, I live in. I'm not from here, but I live in Central Florida, and I always, when people tell me that I live in the South, I correct them and say, "No, I, I have to go north to get to the South." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah north florida is the south uh, yeah. as you point yeah yeah but you're right um uh, <laughs> yeah central florida uh and heading south uh i guess with it, it's a thing unto itself i mean how do you characterize um 
the, 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 how do you begin to d define what uh, Florida is and what being Floridian is. So uh, it's difficult. It, no one it, can seem to put their finger on it. <laughs> yeah. And I've asked, I've asked that. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk a little bit about burial art. This is a very interesting term. And then the lyric, of course, dig me, dig me, dig me now. Mike, are you the burial art in this song? <laughs> no, uh, you know, um, <laughs> this is um, th so that th I, you know, I wrote songs. One song about uh, I wrote uh, songs about my children. Mm -hmm. So burial art is the song I wrote <laughs> um, with my wife in mind, um, which is. You know, that is pretty telling that I would write a song for her called Burial Art, or at least with her in mind. But um, no, just the, um, that metaphor, whatever, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, because, you know, there is burial art. It, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's um, so you know, obscure enough to, you know, people would be saying, what the frig is this guy uh, talking about? But then it plays into the, like you just said, the whole uh, dig me is like, you know, I hope you dig me. Really, nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I was trying to somehow uh, mesh those two part of the songs. And, um, but uh, but I like the yeah, double I mean, meaning there. It's a, it's a it's a great double meaning, and it's uh, it's it's one of the things that I think that as a, as a writer, I've always tried to come up with you know fun double meanings like that. So it's kind of cool when it works like that. Well, yeah, I hope it works. I you know it's that's debatable, but uh, yeah. you no, know, I appreciate <laughs> uh, the, the suggestion that it, the that there's some. Uh, uh, internal uh consistency there yeah. so you're you're very self-deprecating about your your songwriting but i i feel like you've you do i mean you're very good at it so um but it's it's good that you're humble i guess um let's talk about universal glue huh. I, I wondered if this mention of 75 was just coincidental or was that a callback to the song 74 75 because it's got a, a bit of a a vibe of the ring the same kind of vibe to it and the word rings is in the song yeah that's uh that's a, all great points yeah no it's not coincidental that the uh it that's not the year that i when i originally wrote the song that i used um uh because i'd started writing that song about the time that the songs for ring uh, were coming together so you make a, a really astute observation um yeah, it is um, sort of of a of a of a type with a lot of the other songs on Ring, um, in, you know, including the fact that it is a little more up tempo. Um, but yeah, so the, yeah, it was purposeful. Uh, the reference to uh, seventy five, um, and now my dog is trying to get to another part of the sofa. Come on, <laughs> sorry, okay. no, no problem, no problem. Yeah. Sticking yeah. with that. Um, Sticking with that question about whether things are intentional, the song Stars, you also refer to stars in the songs uh, Song for Duncan and Hello, Walter. Is that coincidental? That is coincidental. That is coincidental. Yeah. I, I, and I, I wasn't even aware of that. So thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> um, yeah, I was oblivious. Uh, so, yeah, um, unless, uh, unless um some part of my mind is working in ways that i'll uh, that i'm not aware then uh it was at, um it was there was no purpose behind that mm -hmm. but um yeah uh stars is uh kind of an interesting little number um you put a horn in there there's a there's uh what trumpet in there right there is yeah um and there's a, a little bit of trumpet the outro of, uh, of helium and um, I think there's another uh, 
song that might employ a little bit of trumpet. Um, this guy, a friend, and a, uh, his first play, uh, Mike Mole is his name, M O L E. Mm -hmm. And he first played with us when he was in high school here in Raleigh. I mean, maybe as far back as 87 or 88 or something like that. And then had gone decades without uh, playing with him. Um, but then somehow we reconnected. And so on those occasions that we do get together to play, um, he'll often, if he, you know, uh, if, if circumstances allow, it will join us and play on um, some of the older songs that have trumpet, like uh, Over There and uh, Two Gone. And then, you know, on some of these newer tunes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you embrace or do you shun the term jangle rock when you hear it associated <laughs> with you guys? Yeah. Um, uh, I think the answer would be neither. Um, I, I get it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in the early days, George Huntley and I were each playing a flipping Rickenbacker 12 string. And, you know, I love the birds and I love when the Beatles employed 12 strings and, and anyone that has ever employed a 12 string, I love, but, you know, um, you're sort of setting yourself up for that. <laughs> for that when you when you when you use two 12 string rickenbackers mm -hmm. uh, and you know we were never going to be confused with um you know how to, yeah, some more hard edge alternative music uh certainly grunge so you know I, I get it i get it i don't i don't love it but i i don't uh um, I, I guess I, because it makes sense to me, I, I, I don't feel too much. I, I don't think it's a, um, a huge slight necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're tough on your, um, on the songs that you've written, you, you, at least you seem to be, but do you have a favorite song on Stedman's Wake? Whoa. Um, Uh, the song uh, "Fading In" I wrote about uh, one of my my kids, uh, and the other song, a little more obviously, a song for Duncan is about the other. Um, so, you know, I'm uh, feel uh, uh, um, some uh, I don't know connection is the word. Uh, those are a little more personal. Uh, to me than a lot of the other tunes for you know obvious reasons right. um but just in terms of um sonically and and lyrically and, and arrangement wise um do, uh, you know maybe rusted fields i don't know okay you mentioned Mike, um, the Birds and the Beatles already. Was there, was there an album or a record when you were a kid that you gravitated to? That like the earliest one you can remember? Oh man! So this would have been sixty five, sixty six that I was, you know, at the ripe old age of six and seven, was absolutely enthralled with whatever whoever was coming on Ed Sullivan on Sunday night, but I mean, obviously, even at that age, uh, I, I would have to say it was the Beatles that first just totally floored me. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Stones, a lot of my buddies, their older brothers were playing Stones records. Um, but I mean, The Love and Spoonful, the first single that I ever owned was Do You Believe in Magic? Um, okay. I mean, where do you begin? Uh, and then, uh, I think Blown in the Wind was the first, uh, you know, I had an acoustic guitar in an early age. So that was, I think, the first song that I tried to write. So, um, I mean, all of it. I just was, my, my thinking was, whatever it is these folks are doing, I want some of that. Um, 
So it was, I was transported by, you know, what I was, what I was hearing. Mm. And then you know, that, uh, that never, that never stopped. So. And when you went off to college, you know, do you, do you recall what you were listening to at that time? You mentioned the Smiths earlier. Oh yeah. So yeah, my college years, 77 to 81, at some point early on in those years, it was all um, or primarily what was coming out of England from the clash, you know, the sex pistols to a less lesser extent, because, you know, there is that one record, like two songs on that record. I love and maybe the rest I could take or leave. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, all of it, which also, you know, eventually coincided with, with MTV, but, um, and then closer to home, the Ramones, uh, Talking Heads, and then even far closer to home, REM, um, they, they shipped me up pretty good. And the fact that, uh, the rhythm section, Mike Mills and Bill Barry were making Georgia guys also, you know, uh, factored in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I've, I've always been an Anglophile. And, um, I mean, hell, I was living in Macon, really a few miles from where the Allman Brothers were living and recording. And, you know, I understood, I appreciated in the early 70s how amazing those guys were, but I didn't fully appreciate um, how – amazing they were and i it's not what i wanted to listen to at that age yeah. um which i'm so i'm going back before college but yeah college um uh, most mostly from from england and then lesser known bands um well well I, you know you two of course but not one of those lesser known bands but the <laughs> undertones yeah. from uh from northern ireland stiff little fingers from northern ireland um I mean, I'm going to be kicking myself for for not thinking of so many bands. The Jam out of London, I love those guys. Um, it, they fit a little more into the jangle uh, pop mode. Yeah. But um, uh, the Pogues, love the Pogues. Um, okay. So anyway, yeah. Do you, that's, do, you, uh, <laughs> do you still listen to a lot of music, or do you not have time to do that with the with the family and everything? Uh, I do have uh, time, not as much time, and a lot of times I'm not the one selecting what's being played. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is cool as well, because I'm, um, you know, then end up forced. Uh, well, I end up listening to stuff that I would not have otherwise listened to, and a lot of times find myself um, really enjoying that. I've been on a big frightened rabbit kick um, okay. lately. Um, so, but yeah, yeah. How do you, uh, yeah. how do you guys listen? Do you, do you listen? Do you do vinyl? Do you do CDs? Do you do digital? How, how are you listening these days? Yeah. You know, as a songwriter, I'm, a, I, I'm ashamed to say that I, uh, as a consumer take advantage of, you know, the fact that you can pay 12, 15 bucks a month and have access to almost all the songs, you know, ever recorded. Mm -hmm. As a songwriter, I think it sucks pretty much. But um, uh, so, yeah, it would have I, I held on to about 50 to 100 of my uh, favorite albums. And they're still sitting down uh, stairs. Hopefully they haven't been ruined by just sitting for so long. But, yeah, no, I have every intention of buying a good turntable and, and going that route again. Yeah. And uh, my, my, my kids are uh, now getting to an age where they – I uh, think that would be really cool to, to be playing albums. Do you, have your kids been to your shows? They have. Yeah. What do they think? Of, what do they think of dad's band? Yeah. Uh, they've gone from being uh, completely embarrassed about it. <laughs> to, uh, kind of seeing uh, some aspects of it that, that they think are, are, are kind of cool. Um, they hear, I guess, from enough of their, friends parents that oh, oh you know back in the day we were going to see your dad play and you know own this record or that record and uh at school i guess some teachers uh expressed some interest uh when they learned that you know um that 
you know, their their dad was was in a band, mm -hmm. so they, they they're coming around yeah. a little bit. It it ain't you know it ain't they're not going to their rooms and putting on Connell's records. I assure <laughs> you that. <laughs> but uh, if they're if they're at a party and one of the songs comes on, I don't think they uh, clear out of out of the house right away. You know, well, baby steps, right? <laughs> yeah, baby steps indeed. Um, when you talk to your brother, David, do you guys ever just marvel that you guys are still doing this all these years later? Yeah. Marvel would be one word for it. Um, uh, you know, we like, uh, we look at one another, uh, the other guys in the band as well. And like, really, uh, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> you know, um, uh, can we not, you know, act our age, you know, grow up and, and just, <laughs> retire it for once and for all it's old habits die hard yeah. so um i chalk i chalk it up to that but um uh, yeah we do yes we do more we do marvel uh, uh at at that the thought yeah it's it's it i mean i'm so 62 and the fact that i've been doing this more, uh, more than half of my life um uh, is is pretty crazy yeah um, what are the plans for Stedman's Wake in terms of performing live? Uh, you guys aren't really, you mentioned you guys all have real jobs. Uh, you can't be touring for a few months. So, you know, what are you guys doing with, uh, in terms of live shows? Yeah, a lot. Well, yeah, uh, pretty hit or miss. So um, we played uh, a show in Durham, North Carolina, not long after things it, were starting to open up. Mm -hmm. And venues were uh, again having live music, um, so yeah, that in June or may maybe early July, we we played over in Durham, uh, an outdoor show, and uh, it, it went um, it, not having played for a year and a half. It, there had no idea how that might go, but it ended up being a blast. It was a fun night, and the reception was nice. But we've been we've been really fortunate in that respect. We've, uh, we've had, uh, over the years crowds that were really forgiving and really nice. And so that was the case that night we played in Nashville, Tennessee, a few weeks ago, uh, the 17th of August. So just, uh, about a month ago, um, we're going to be playing in Athens, Georgia and Atlanta, Georgia, this Friday and Saturday. Um, it's, uh, it's been about 20 years since we played. Well, I take that back. We did play an outdoor festival in Athens the summer before uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And and we have played in Atlanta still over the years. But uh, so, yeah, Athens, Atlanta, and then Brooklyn, New York at the end of this month. Um, Ash, Asheville, North Carolina, um, also this month. And then Chapel Hill uh, in October and our home, Raleigh, hometown Raleigh in December. And so that rounds out the year uh, 2021. All right. The uh, the album is called Stedman's Wake. Uh, it, does it help you if folks buy it from your website? Do you get a little bit more money if they go through your website? I, I think I think the answer would be yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's yeah, the, so. theconnells.com? It is. Yeah. And where else can folks find you guys? You guys on social at all? I, I know you have a... Somebody's running your Twitter account because I, I, I I'm following that. But uh, you know where where else can people find you guys online? Yeah. Um. So I uh I don't I don't have any I don't I'm I'm not I, I'm social. Um, my social media acumen is as low as as it gets. But I think Twitter and Facebook, um, and then you know the streaming services. Mm -hmm. I, I know that's not social media but anyway uh, yeah, it all works uh, mike Connell, it's it's been a real pleasure for me to talk to you i'm i think that the new album's great stedman's weight comes out september 24th go buy it i uh, believe it's even on vinyl so vinyl people can uh, can have it and um you know best of luck with it because it's a really good it's a really great record I, I can't tell you how much i appreciate your questions i mean it's um yeah it's been a blast and uh, Thank you for taking your time to do this. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it.